Welcome to the NPT Podcast, for physical therapists preparing to sit for the National Physical Therapy Exam. From case studies to content review, we have you covered. Hey, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate you taking your time to spend time with me as we talk about the content on the FSBPT content outline. And just uh, if no one has said thank you to you today, I want to make sure that I say thank you. I know I've said it in other episodes, but thank you so much for the effort you put into this. I know that it makes a world of difference both to your studies, but also to your patients. The more skilled of a clinician you become, the better you can serve those that you'll be you'll be treating down the road and very literally become my colleagues here in just a few weeks as you pass the NPT. So thank you so much for taking the, the time to do that and to really, really hone your skills. I really appreciate that. And I hope you know that it is an effort that is very worthy of your time and energy. So today we'll be talking about the neuromuscular and nervous system. This is the second largest system on the exam. So as you know, through these podcast episodes, we've been going through the FSBPT's content outline. We have gone through several times now, and we just finished up musculoskeletal, headed down now today to the neuromuscular and nervous system. Now on the exam, you you can expect somewhere between 44 and 50 questions related to the neuromuscular and nervous system. And this is one, I'll be honest with you, when I was preparing for the NPT, this is one that always made me the most nervous, (laughs) no pun intended. But this is one, it's, there's just so many details, so many interesting little tips and bits that you have to try to get all together for a test day. And so my goal today is to take some of the pain out of that. So we'll be talking specifically about the brachial plexus and the branches of the brachial plexus. So if you remember, read the dang cookbook or Randy Travis drinks cold beer. So roots, trunks, divisions, cords, branches, I have to sound it out in my head, but R-T-D-C-B, read the dang cookbook or Randy Travis drinks cold beer. We'll be talking specifically about the branches of the brachial plexus as we go through. We'll be talking very specifically about the median nerve, ulnar nerve, and radial nerve. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and dive into those. But I guess before we get to there, I just wanted to remind you that uh, we'll be starting up our fresh set of courses this quarter. So we run a fresh set of uh, fresh cohort every quarter as we prepare for each exam date. So the July 2021 exam is the one just coming up around the corner. I know a lot of you who are listening to this are either just in the process of getting your the last little bits in before the April exam as I record this. We'll post this right around the April exam date, but we're just getting started, getting our dates rolled out for the July 2021 cohort. I know there are a lot of you listening today that are headed down the road to a future cohort. So just as a reminder, we run a fresh course every quarter. We have our full VIP class or my VIPT class. (laughs) That's one where we go over how this time we had, I think about 60 live sessions, uh, easily over 120 hours of content that we went through related to the exam. Got a lot of questions answered. We have a really sweet Telegram app, uh, Telegram group where you can get together, talk with your peers, great place to to get your questions answered. That's a ton of fun. Plus you get access to myself so you can schedule one-on-one phone calls with me. If you have coaching questions or, or questions you wanna go through, I can help you. And that's something that's a lot of fun in our small group VIPT class. So if you're interested in that, please check out ptfinalexam.com. Plus you can head over if you're interested in more of a quick review as we head into the last days before the test, we run a crash course about three weeks before every test day. Super inexpensive, great content. We really try to give you the bang for your buck. And so uh, if you have a cohort you'd like to get signed up, we can get you a sweet discount for half price. So be sure to get your whole cohort together. Reach out over at ptfinalexam.com slash contact, or you can reach out directly to me at admin at ptfinalexam.com. All right, let's go ahead and get into our peripheral nerves, the branches of the brachial plexus. Let's start first with, as I was getting this ready today, I wanted to start first with the radial nerve. So this is the one I would argue, well, they're all tested, but the radial nerve is just so easily tested it might be one worth spending a bunch of time on. So if you can remember nothing else from this podcast, just remember that the radial nerve is a beast. The radial nerve is a beast. So B-E-A-S-T. Radial nerve is a beast because of the brachioradialis, all of the extensors, the anconius, the supinator, and the triceps brachii. So B-E-A-S-T. And this is something, again, we go over this in our class a ton. But the radial nerve, it's a beast. It comes, its innervation comes C6 through T1. And the whole job of the radial nerve is to assist with elbow extension and extension of the wrist. 
So that's, that's the primary function of the radial nerve. However, it does have one major exception. So the major exception is the brachioradialis. So if you recall, the brachioradialis is an elbow flexor and a wrist radial deviator. So in that regards, the brachioradialis is a bit of the oddball in the group of muscles that is innervated by the radial nerve. So therefore, it's one of those ones that is so easily tested. So if you had a loss of the musculocutaneous nerve, we're not going to talk a ton about musculocutaneous today, but if you had a loss of the musculocutaneous nerve, which we know innervates the biceps brachii, so that major elbow flexor, in the absence of your major elbow flexors, what support elbow flexors could help out? So you've got two options, really. All right, yeah, more or less two options. You've got the brachioradialis, which is innervated by the radial nerve, and the pronator teres, which is innervated by the median nerve. Both of those can pick up the slack in the case that the musculocutaneous nerve is out. So just remember, the radial nerve is a beast, and the clinical findings, if someone had radial nerve loss, they would have tricep weakness, forearm extensor weakness. So the radial nerve has a sensory component. So if you look on the dorsum of your hand, right around the first web space of your thumb and the dorsum of your hand and forearm, that's where the, sen the primary sensory loss would be if you had loss of the radial nerve. Now, as far as injuries that could cause this, there are two main types of injuries that can cause radial nerve loss. This includes crutch palsy. So if you use axillary crutches improperly, it will press in on that proximal humerus, and that's where the radial nerve winds its way around. It goes through that radial groove in the, on the uh, humerus. If you put undue pressure there, you'll get uh, tricep weakness, you'll get extensor weakness, you'll get uh, a brachioradialis weakness, you get all the weakness if you get an impingement or a crushing injury on the proximal humerus. The other time that you'll see a radial nerve injury will be with a humeral fracture. So again, the same reason that that radial nerve winds its way around the humerus. If for some reason you have a fracture of the humerus, mid-shaft humeral fracture, it is very likely that you would get a radial nerve injury as well, which would result in wrist drop because you've lost the wrist extensors. So that's the radial nerve. The radial nerve is a beast. Key thing to remember is the B in the radial nerve in being a beast is that brachioradialis, which is a little bit of the oddball there. All right, so that's the radial nerve. Let's talk median nerve here for a moment. So median nerve, this is obviously the one implicated in carpal tunnel syndrome. It also has a branch called the anterior interosseous nerve or the AIN. And sorry, I didn't talk about the, with the radial nerve, it has the posterior interosseous branch. So the posterior interosseous branch, we can talk about that coming up in just a sec, but just as a, as a conjugate here, talking about the anterior interosseous branch. So the median nerve, the, it, it gets innervation from C5 through T1. And the acronym to remember for the uh, median nerve is half loaf. So if you remember half loaf, one and two indicates that it, it innervates or it works with the first two lumbricals. So the first two lumbricals. So that would be technically the um, uh, lateral side of the hand or the radial side of the hand. So if you're in an anatomical position, your hand is, is palm forward. And so therefore the radial side of the hand or the thumb side of your hand is the more lateral portion. So to try to keep it all straight, you would refer to it as the first and second lumbricals. All right, so that is the half part. So the one, one half loaf, so the one half L, those, those are the lumbricals. Next one we have is the O, the opponent's pollicis. Opponent's pollicis, that helps bring your thumb towards your pinky. The A, we've got abductor pollicis longus. And then finally, the F is all of the flexors. So you've got the flexor carpi radialis, flexor digitorum, superficialis, and profundus, both of those on the radial side or the lateral side of the hand. Then as far as the sensory input, uh, the sensory input from the median nerve would be to the lateral hand again. And remember, that's the first three digits, thumb, uh, index, and middle finger. That's where you'd get uh, the innervation or the sensory loss from a median nerve loss. Just as a note, though, the anterior interosseous branch, this is one, again, that's heavily tested just because it's tricky to try to keep it all straight. The anterior interosseous branch, that tests the tip-to-tip -tip pinch or the OK sign of, of putting tip to tip your thumb and your index finger. So that's, that is activating the flexor digitorum profundus of the first finger, or sorry, of the index finger, and the flexor pollicis longus of the thumb. 
So when you have the make that tip to tip pinch, that's the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor, digi flexor digitorum profundus. If you are unable to perform tip to tip pinching, that means that you would have a loss of the median nerve. And we'll talk about this just in a minute in relation to the ulnar nerve. Remember, the tip to tip pinch is the conjugate or the reciprocal of the froment sign. And so remember, if you can't perform the froment sign, which is the test for the ulnar nerve, you compensate with the median nerve. And if you can't do the tip to tip pinch, you compensate with the opponent's pollicis, which is that pad to pad grip, pad to pad grip. So you compensate with the ulnar nerve. So you can see how the median and the ulnar compensate for each other if you have one that's lost versus the other. As far as clinical findings with the median nerve, we already talked about the sensory loss. Uh, you'd have weak grasp, especially on the radial side, the loss of the, the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis, and uh, pronation weakness because the pronators are innervated by the median nerve. So that includes pronator teres and pronator quadratus. So you have difficulty pronating the hand, and then uh, obviously you'd be unable to flex the the uh, index and middle finger, especially because of the loss of the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis on the radial side. So the last one I want to talk about is the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve, this is the final branch I wanted to talk about today. The ulnar nerve goes from, it, it gets its, uh, arises from the C8 to T1 nerve roots. And the acronym to remember for the ulnar nerve is MAFIA. So if you can remember the MAFIA, the ulnar nerve is the MAFIA. And maybe it's, you can think of it coming around on the back or the, the little finger side, like it's trying to sneak in, I guess. That's one way to think about it. But that's the MAFIA. Uh, so as far as the MAFIA goes, the ulnar nerve has M-A-F-I-A. -A. So the first M, or the A, sorry, the only M, the M is the medial lumbricals. So that's the third and fourth lumbricals. And again, anatomical position, that's the fourth and fifth fingers. Uh, so third and fourth lumbricals. Uh, so that's the M. The A, you've got adductor pollicis. Adductor pollicis, that's maybe the most important one to remember for the ulnar nerves, the adductor pollicis. That's what, that's what you're testing with froment sign as you try to do a pad or a key pinch grip. So that's the M, A. Then you have a bunch of Fs. You've got the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum profundus, everything on the medial side or the fourth on the, the ulnar side, I should say. That's the F. Then the I, you've got the dorsal interossei, so the interossei innervated by the ulnar nerve as well. So M-A-F-I. And the final A is that abductor digiti minimi or abductor digiti quinti. That's the what pulls the pinky away from the other fingers. So you've got the medial lumbricals, the adductor pollicis, all of the flexors, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum profundus, flexor pollicis brevis. Uh, so all the, all the ulnar side flexors, as well as the dorsal interossei, that's the I. And then the final A is the abductor digiti quinti. As far as clinical findings for someone with an ulnar nerve loss, they would have loss of the, the I guess, I should, I should make sure to make this distinction. The medial half of the fourth digit and the fifth digit. So it's, it's half of the fourth finger and all of the fifth finger. That's the sensory uh, loss that you'd get from an ulnar nerve loss. And I think most of us have probably experienced this when you hit your funny bone. That's what happens. You get an ulnar nerve neuropraxia. So if you had ulnar nerve loss, you'd also have loss of the intrinsics of the thumb, including the inability to adduct the thumb or to abduct the fingers. So you'd lose the dorsal interossei and the adductor pollicis. You'd also have weakness with ulnar deviation. We already talked about the sensory loss and hypothenar eminence wasting. Perfect. So the final thing I just wanted to mention here is the, the difference between a median nerve lesion and a, and a ulnar nerve lesion in regards to how they look as far as the presentation or the deformity of the hand. So if you were to all make a hand, make a, a palm open hand, so open your hand all the way up. If you had lost the median nerve, you would be unable to flex your thumb first, or thumb index and middle finger. And so if you were to make a fist, try to make a fist without moving your first three digits, and you'll see that you're in uh, this is often, it's often called the papal sign. It is a bit of a misnomer because chances are the Pope wasn't trying to fist bump someone. Rather, they were trying to bless with an open hand. We'll talk about that in a sec here with ulnar nerve. But if you try to make a fist without moving the first three fingers, the thumb, index, and middle finger, you'll see that you make the you, three fingers are still left sticking out. And so that's what's called the median claw or the median nerve lesion. 
Now the opposite, or not opposite, I should say a very similar pattern is presented when you have an ulnar nerve lesion. Now remember the ulnar nerve innervates the lumbricals, fourth and fifth lumbricals. So when your hand is at rest, if you were to hold your hand, put it at rest, loss of lumbricals means that your fourth and fifth fingers would go into hyperextension at the MCP, so hyperextension at your knuckles, and then flexion in the PIPs and DIPs of the fourth and fifth digits. So again, it creates a very similar position, but this time when it occurs when you're opening the hand or trying to create an open or, or palm flat type hand. So that's the difference between the median lesion and the ulnar lesion is that the median lesion shows up when you're trying to make a fist and the ulnar lesion shows up when you're trying to open the hand or open the fist. And so that's where there's some confusion. Which one is the, the hand of benediction or the papal hand? Um, yeah, still up for discussion. Again, it's a, a question of, okay, did the Pope have an ulnar nerve palsy or a median nerve palsy or what was going on? Chances are he probably was trying to open his hand rather than do a fist bump. So uh, you, you can have some fun research, researching that on the internet, trying to find, okay, which one is the Pope's hand? Rather, I'd have you memorize it in, re in relation to uh, what you're trying to do and what the weakness is caused or what weakness, what muscle weakness is causing the deformity to occur. Awesome. So there you go. We've talked about the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, and the radial nerve. Now, just a really quick note about the posterior interosseous nerve. So remember the posterior interosseous nerve, this is a branch of the radial nerve. We didn't talk about this. This is what goes through the arcade of Froch. Remember the arcade of Froch. Uh, so it's a branch of the a branch of the radial nerve, and it hits the extensor wad. So specifically extensor digitorum, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor di digiti minimi, extensor carpi ulnaris. It does hit uh, the supinator muscle as well. So the, the posterior interosseous nerve is of great significance because it's usually trapped at the supinator. And uh, uh, you can also get it from a dislocation of the proximal head of the radius. All of this can cause wrist drop because you lose a bunch of the extensors on the, um, yeah, on the, in the extensor water, all of those extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, uh, all those extensors. So posterior interosseous nerve hits the extensors, anterior interosseous nerve, branch of the median nerve, does the tip to tip pinch. And just, I know as, as you listen to this in audio format, you know, you're probably out for a jog or driving somewhere. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm there with you trying to, trying to show you with my hand, but in, unfortunately you'll have to just imagine it at this point, uh, how to make these, these lesions. I mean, you know, when we get through our crash course or even in our, in our VIP class, we go through all these deformities. We try to show it, draw it, put pictures up. I mean, this is all related to like, I had questions about Deputrans contractures because a Deputrans contracture also looks like an ulnar claw, which also looks like a median claw. They all look about the same, but they are caused for different reasons. Uh, same thing for Klumpke's palsy and Herb's palsy, all these hand deformities from the loss of different either um, roots, nerve roots, or peripheral branches. There, there's just a lot. So if you have questions about the neuromuscular nervous system, I'd encourage you to join, jump into at least our crash course. We go through all this in a bit more detail and you can see it, which helps it stay, keep it straight for test day. All right, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and bring this session to a conclusion. Appreciate you taking the time to spend with me. I know that it it's, can be a very stressful time trying to get ready for the NPT, and I want to take as much stress away from you as possible. And so part of that is just getting good content. If you can get good content and see how they would ask questions about it, that's what makes for the best study plan. Because uh, let's be honest, seeing the words on a page is one thing, but actually understanding or getting a deep grasp of the content, that's what they're after on test day. That's what is required for critical thinking. And I'd say that's that's really required for for stepping up your, your physical therapy from, uh, like when I first got out of school, I think I was more of a cookbook therapist, meaning that I tried to memorize protocols, just kind of do, it, do a cookbook for every patient versus actual problem solving and saying, oh, this is what's going on and this is how I fix it because that's what they're really after on the test is trying to see if you can be a, a, an effective, direct, and safe physical therapist. So, 
All right, with that, go ahead and check out all of our other episodes. We've got lots of other episodes. If you haven't, please take a moment, head over to iTunes or Google Play or wherever you're listening to this podcast. Leave us a five-star review. It does take time and money to get these these podcast episodes posted and ready for, for you to check it out. So if you don't mind, just take a moment, do us a favor, do us a real solid, head over and leave us a five-star review. It makes a world of difference. So with that, check out ptfinalexam.com for any questions you may have, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks. This podcast was sponsored by PT Final Exam, an awesome resource for MPTE preparation. From live courses to university cohorts, PT Final Exam has a package to suit everyone's needs. Head over to ptfinalexam.com to see the wide variety of MPTE preparation options.